All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's botanical briefing. My name is David Barry. I am the Vice President for Visitor Engagement and Chief Museum Curator at Maurice Salby Botanical Gardens. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Marissa Hirshon, who is the Curator of Cotizan and Decorative Arts at the John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art here in Sarasota. Um, Marissa is uh, going to talk a little bit about some of her previous research and reference some of the works in our current Tiffany exhibition. Uh, and we are uh, privileged to have her today to sort of set, shed some light on um, our current Tiffany exhibition, which is coming to, to a close after uh, four and a half very successful months. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Marissa. And I should just mention before I do, uh, we will field questions in the chat feature on Zoom. And uh, my colleague, Kelsey Childs, will answer um, some of the more logistical questions that tend to come in. Uh, but we will um, reserve a couple of those at the end uh, to, to ask Marissa uh, at the end of her talk. But we will um, open the field for her uh, to give her presentation and we'll come back to those questions at the very end. So uh, Marissa, without further ado, uh, over to you for the glass designs of Tiffany Studios, artistry inspired by nature. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here to share my research with all of you today. And I want to thank David and his colleagues at Selby Gardens for the invitation to talk. I'm really excited to share with you my perspective on the works in the exhibition and the wonderful installations throughout the conservatory and gardens and also talk to you about the window you see here that was originally commissioned for a Gilded Age mansion. So when I first encountered the installations at the opening, I was so excited to see these Tiffany inspired designs that reminded me of a number of works of art from Tiffany's lifetime. And so I wanted to draw some connections about how these really are creatively and wonderfully um, bringing Tiffany back to life. So when you first enter the conservatory, if you've seen the show, there's this wonderful array of plants surrounding what looks like an abstract version of Tiffany's windows. And this really um, made me recall this wonderful portrait of Tiffany that was um, painted at his country estate on Long Island. And he's surrounded by his garden, sitting at his easel, painting out of doors. And it really, this portrait conveys his appreciation for nature and how he often studied flowers in real life for design inspiration. So Louis Cumber Tiffany was born in 1848, and he was the son of the Tiffany and Company founder, Charles Tiffany. As a young man, he pursued painting early on as his artistic training. And then by the 1880s, he turned his focus to interior decoration with a collaborative group known as Associated Artist. He went on to lead a commercial enterprise that eventually became known as Tiffany Studios, where he was inspired to bring the beauty of the natural world into the home with innovative products that have become icons of American design. As you continue walking through the conservatory, there are these wonderful installations amongst the orchids, and this drew to mind one of the earliest windows by Tiffany for the Bella Apartments, which um, was his actual home at the time. And he did this beautiful abstract design making use of opalescent glass, which had been newly developed at the turn of the century to make use of colors within the molten glass batch itself. So you could create a variety of colors, patterns, and textures. And this totally revolutionized the way stained glass windows were made. This sunset window in the gardens really was delightful to see, and it reminded me of this seascape window at the Chrysler Museum of Art, where I worked over a decade ago studying their encyclopedic glass collection, and they also have an amazing Tiffany collection. So if you haven't been to Norfolk, Virginia, I highly recommend you check out their glass galleries. 
And I wanted to show you this window because it shows how Tiffany Studios combined this use of layering different sheets of glass that were specially made to create this illusion of a landscape. So there are layers of different patterns, honeycomb textures, there's mottled soft pinks and blues and yellows to create what the sky would look like at sunset. There are enameled layers that depict the waves and clouds. And there is this beautiful frame of faceted or chipped glass jewels that um, completes this piece. And this would have been hung in a window so that natural light would illuminate it. The living lampshade at Selby Gardens is just amazing. It's a larger than life version that you can walk through a lampshade and it really reminded me of how a number of Tiffany's lampshade designs recreate a trellis um, as you can see here and this bird's eye view while we can't normally get this view I think is a wonderful way to look at these lampshade designs that are all inspired by naturalistic imagery. Once you get into the gallery, you're greeted by some of the most celebrated designs of lampshades. The daffodil, laburnum, and dragonfly lamps are on view. And for almost a century, these works were all considered to be designs by Tiffany himself. Not until 2007, when there was an exhibition and book about the Tiffany Girls, a group of women who worked for Tiffany Studios, um, was their critical role revealed. And they were both designers and glass cutters and selectors um, in the women's department that was led by Clara Driscoll, who you see here in this group portrait of the women on the rooftop of Tiffany Studios building. And these women mainly worked in anonymity, but they played a vital role to realize Tiffany's most famous designs. And the reason why this exhibition and book came to be was that a cache of letters of Driscoll's that she wrote to her relatives was rediscovered. And through that correspondence, her role in developing designs and supervising the glass chosen for lampshades and other luxury goods um, was confirmed. The daffodil lamp is really wonderful in evoking the guiding philosophy of nature-based themes for the firm's designs. The um, artisans at Tiffany Studios often refer to live flower specimens to guide their designs, and they chose specific kinds of opalescent glass to give the illusion of three-dimensional flowers. So here you can see how this yellow spotted or mottled glass was used to give the illusion of the trumpet of the daffodil. And also this streaky glass was used to um, recreate what the leaves looked like. And Tiffany Studios also had a bronze foundry in Queens in New York that was established at, whoops, I hope you don't see that, um, that was established um, around 1897. And so this allowed for all of these beautiful lampshades to have interchangeability of components. So a client, when purchasing one of these lamps, could pick the base that they wanted to complement it. The laburnum lampshade was a Tiffany design based on a tree native to Europe, and I think it beautifully evokes the yellow clusters that grow on the tree in the springtime. And this lamp is made of thousands of pieces of opalescent glass that create that impression of cascading flowers. And the asymmetrical edge, I think, is especially evocative of the way these clusters of flowers hang on this tree. And this design is thought to probably have been designed by Clara Driscoll in the early 1900s. There were a number of companies that commissioned work by Tiffany Studios in addition to individual buyers. And the Chicago department store, Marshall Field and Company, patronized Tiffany Studios for a number of decorations 
as well as items to sell. And the store commissioned this large hanging lampshade that's another variation of the laburnum design in the early 1900s. And one of the most celebrated lamps by Tiffany Studios is the dragonfly design. There are a number of variations out there, but um, this, these two examples show you how the variety of opalescent glass available could create a, con a completely different look for the dragonfly in the background. So the example at the Chrysler Museum of Art has this beautiful model blue glass and these cabochons that represent the watery background. And then you can see this wonderful twisted, twisted trunk um, lampshade base. And then another collection has this contrasting orange background. So you can see how each piece would be um, unique, even though they're following the same pattern design. And the beautiful brass filigree used for the dragonfly wings, you can see some surviving examples here and how these would be used for the design. So here you see a cartoon or working drawing that's the same size as the lampshade, 22 inches. And this is what the artisans would use to guide their selection of glass and the cutting of the individual pieces. This example is on view at Selby, and it's really a stunning one where this lampshade base truly sets it apart from other works that were also made at the time. And while this is beautifully distinctive, I just wanted to show you how there are a number of variations out there with blown glass bases like the central example and dragonflies on this base, um, but the beautiful leaves and mosaics on the one from this private collection is really great to see, and I'd never seen one quite like this before. So that's why it's really wonderful to have this lone exhibition on view. As you continue to walk through the gardens, I really love this installation with the light streaming through. And I think this wonderfully recreated how colorful shadows could be cast through lampshades as well as windows, depending on the time of day and the sunlight. And that brings us to this wonderful example of a Tiffany Clematis fine window. And as someone who studied Tiffany Studios for a number of years, it was really exciting to see this because, again, this is in a private collection, so normally uh, it's not available to be seen. And again, I'd never seen one quite like this, but there are, are a number of wonderful details that Tiffany is known for that you can see here. That colonnade has a wonderful um, recreation of perspective with these smaller columns in the distance and this trellis of the flowers up above. And then that mottled green glass that you see for the background, for me, I interpret that as potentially being rolling green hills. And Tiffany often used these kinds of book glass to recreate different materials, almost like painting in glass. And one of the most beautiful windows I've seen with columns is this example that's now in a Florida collection, the Charles Hosmore Morse Museum of American Art in Winter Park, Florida. And if you haven't had a chance to visit that museum, I again, highly recommend it um, because you can see this work on view that was shown at a World's Fair in 1893 in Chicago and eventually came to Tiffany's country estate, Laurelton Hall. And you can also see alongside it, this wonderful watercolor drawing that the window's based on. So this would have guided the final design. And again, the opalescent glass used here, you see drapery glass to evoke the folds of fabric, wonderful different kinds of glass with patterns to create the tile floor and the flamingo feathers. And then this gorgeous um, glass used to recreate a fishbowl hanging up above. So I wanna look at a few designs with you today from Laurelton Hall, just to give you a sense of the breadth of designs that were made by Tiffany Studios and his palatial residence that had 84 rooms on Long Island was a showcase for all of the amazing things this firm could do. So this was a 600 acre estate on the Northern shore of Long Island. 
And there are a few beautiful um, outdoor spaces with designs that we're gonna look at, the loggia and this terrace. So Tiffany worked on additions to this home over a number of years, and the Daffodil Terrace was created around 1914 to 1915 with these gorgeous capitals made out of glass for those daffodils as well as cement. And these are now again at the Winter Park Museum since Laurelton Hall no longer stands. And the loggia has been installed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in their American wing for a number of years. And again, just shows you how you can see in this image how the hanging lanterns, the columns with beautiful flower capitals, and these mosaics up above, um, how much color was incorporated into this area. So while Tiffany had inherited a huge amount of wealth from his father and then later became involved with Tiffany and Company as artistic director. He was independently successful with Tiffany Studios and Laurelton Hall was arguably one of his greatest achievements with him designing almost every aspect of the home. And one of the interior spaces that had beautiful wisteria windows framing a view of the gardens is seen here. And these panels have been separated and are at a number of art museums today. During my museum career, I've studied a lot of Tiffany windows. And this example is from the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And I wanted to point out some of the details about opalescent glass so you can get a sense of how much detail and craftsmanship was involved in all of these windows. So first I wanna point out what's called confetti glass here. That is a type of glass that was made by sprinkling in different shards and pieces of colored glass into a molten glass as you're making the sheet. And then it's able to be broken up and used to create this illusion of a forest floor with scattered leaves. There's also beautiful texture to this window that, unfortunately, uh, presentation can't fully show you, but if you ever have the chance to go to Houston, this is in the American galleries, and these irises, for instance, are beautiful pieces of molded opalescent glass that have a three-dimensional depth to them. And Tiffany really became known for imitating all these kinds of lifelike details, like these rocks that line the brook, the beautiful streaked brown glass that creates the tree trunks, and the mottled glass that's used for the tree canopy. So it appears to have sun dappled light coming through the trees. And in the distance here, you can make out there's a rippled glass um, that's for uh, water in the distance. And Interestingly, while this is definitely an amazing work of art, its origin is unknown today, and there still are a number of mysteries about Tiffany windows because they no longer survive in their original collection. So by time the MFA Houston acquired this work in the 1990s, it was unknown what space it was in originally, but it's thought that it came from a private residence and may have been on a staircase landing. So their curatorial team is still searching for details and clues that may lead to rediscovering um, where it was originally installed. For the rest of today's talk, I want to share with you my research on this window, Woman in a Pergola with Wisteria, that is in the Chrysler Museum of Arts collection. And it's been in this collection since Walter Chrysler Jr. acquired it at auction in the 1970s. But when it came into his collection, there was very little documentation about the patron and the house that it came from. So I began to do my curatorial detective work to look into where this window came from. And I also worked on the redesign and reinstallation of their glass galleries during my time there. So if you're ever in Norfolk, you can see this window and a number of other works installed in their spaces. 
And if you're curious to learn more about this window and other works from their collection, there's a wonderful book, um, Masterworks of Glass, that is still available that I worked on uh, a decade ago. So here you see Joseph Raphael de Lamar. He was the patron of Tiffany Studios who commissioned the window and it was commissioned for his Long Island estate, Pembroke, that was not too far from Laurelton Hall. And he worked with Charles Gilbert, a society architect who also built his city residence in New York City. And he worked on a number of mansions of this size. And just to give you a little background about the North Shore of Long Island, it became popular as a summer resort in the late 19th century. And then a number of very wealthy New Yorkers began to build mansions on large estates here. And so it became nicknamed the Gold Coast because it became this area of wealth. And so this completely transformed what used to be a quiet village, Glen Cove, where Ben Pembroke was located, into these massive estates of some of New York's most prominent citizens in the early 20th century. So here you see the entrance to the mansion that's in the French neoclassical style. And there's a beautiful formal garden as you approach the entrance. The Tiffany window I showed you was located right here above the entrance on this mezzanine. And in addition to Pembroke's location being important, De La Mar became really well known for his expansive gardens on the estate. And I want to take you through the entrance and the approach to the mansion so you can see um, how lavish this estate was. So here is a postcard of the entrance to Pembroke and like many mansions of this era that no longer survive, this kind of ephemera really helps to bring um, what this estate looked like back to life. There was a long sweeping driveway that led up to the home and it was lined by mature trees and hydrangeas. And just to give you a sense of how large this property is, um, here's a bird's eye view where you can see the mansion um, faces the water and there's wonderful series of gardens here like this one um, that was a Japanese inspired garden with a bridge that led to a gazebo. And in the background, you can see there is a water tower, as well as supporting buildings that include the carriage house um, and where many staff would have been housed to run this huge estate. This colored image of the mansion is really great to see because most photographs will not show us all the wonderful details and color. And I wanna point out here, the beautiful rooftop pergola, the um, contrasting red tile roof, and this European and styled formal garden and fountain that leads up to the front entrance. As guests would have entered the home, they would have walked through a marble vestibule and then entered the entry hall, which was framed by neoclassical columns and statuary. And I want to draw your attention to this detail here. There's a console for a residential organ. And as guests who would have been invited upstairs, um, they would have seen the Tiffany window up on the mezzanine landing that was the backdrop for another organ console. So Joseph Raphael de la Bar not only um, commissioned one of the most revered stained glass makers of the early 20th century, he also followed trends among the very rich to have an Aeolian organ installed in his home so he could have private concerts to entertain his guests. And this was popular at the time with a number of other well-known patrons like John and Mabel Ringling, who had an alien organ installed in their home, Cotizan in Sarasota. And here you can see a Gothic revival style console in the Great Hall. And Tiffany himself also had a console in his living space at Laurelton Hall with pipes hidden in the walls. 
And one of the best discoveries I made about this window's original location is seen in this photograph that came from the Aeolian Organ Company's marketing materials. So they made a number of brochures over the years, and I was able to track down one from around 1914 that shows the prominent placement of the Tiffany window in this alcove behind that neoclassical style console. And this picture had never been seen before by any of my colleagues at the Chrysler a decade ago. And it was really exciting to learn so much about where this window came from, just from one image. And this led me to realize that De La Mar's choice of Tiffany designs, that was a preeminent maker of stained glass, along with the Alien Company, was part of his ambitions as someone who was a self-made man a millionaire to really try to join the highest echelons of New York society. He was trying to show his taste in music, in art, in design, and in his collection of plants throughout the home and conservatory, um, and how these were cultivated interests to enter that level of society. So imagine, if you will, coming into this home and being surrounded by beautiful arts and furnishings and design and having this organ music wafting through the air and seeing a beautiful, colorful Tiffany window behind it. And just for your knowledge, this grill here hides thousands of Tiffany, I'm sorry, thousands of pipes for the Aeolian organ. So the contract for the Aeolian organ survives for Pembroke in an archives in New Jersey. And I was able to see a lot of details about Opus 1217 that was specifically made to fit in this home. So this involved collaboration with not only Tiffany Studios, but also the architect and contractors to make sure everything fit perfectly. And this was a huge expense for De Lamar, who at the time spent around $30,000 for this organ, which was a very large amount of money at the time. And then he added additions costing $12,000 in 1914. And the contract even notes that the console would be installed behind a beautiful stained glass window. So it was already in place when the organs um, instrumental details were added to the home. So taking a closer look at the windows design as it survives today, I want to explore how this encapsulates De Lamar's taste in horticulture. And you can see here this beautiful wisteria blooming that's hanging on a trellis up above and this colonnade that surrounds a female figure in the center. And you can see here again the beautiful drapery glass that follows the curves and folds of her dress. And there's also wonderful opalescent glass used to create this watery floor that she's standing upon and these marble columns. So a lot of Details about De Lamar were published in newspapers at the time. And so I was able to find um, some reports about his personality and his interest. And it was written in the 19 teens that his greatest delight was in gathering rare plants and flowers of which he possessed a wonderful collection. And just to give you more context for this gorgeous estate, here's another view of that formal garden with a fountain at the center that leads up to the approach of the home. And there's another pergola in the gardens here, um, which were quite popular at the time. And we see a number of pergolas throughout the extensive grounds, like down by the water at the bathing pavilion where De Lamar and guests could change into swimsuits before going swimming. You can see again, pergolas um, built as part of that structure. Amazingly, there is a watercolor design that survives from around 1910 that's now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art collection. And it really is revealing to see elements of the window that no longer survive, but were once installed in the home. So I'd like to draw your attention to this 
upper portion of three clerestory windows where you can see what looks like the darkened sky that could be a clue to say this would have been a night scene or twilight scene. And then also up above in the pergola, there is a scarab, which was a well-known Egyptian symbol for rebirth. And all of these details very closely correspond to the final executed design. And this design drawing was signed by Louis Comfortivity himself, which typically indicates his approval to move forward with making a life-size cartoon that would be used to guide the glass selection. And you can see here in particular the sinuous lines, vines of the wisteria growing up the columns that match very closely to the final work. So here you can see again, just to reference back to the original location, how fascinating it is for me as a historian, and I hope for you too, of how this design corresponds to the installation. Um, however, originally the window had those upper portions that you can just barely see behind the arch there. And the windows uh, as part of the triptych were spaced out more broadly as part of this part of the facade. So there also were a number of other Tiffany Studios windows installed at the home that survive in private collections that I want to show you as well, because De Lamar, while he's largely forgotten today, was actually a very important patron of Tiffany Studios, and he commissioned some truly amazing designs. And this postcard shows you the west facade facing Long Island Sound, the water, and its um, I wanted to point out this detail here. This is where the breakfast room was located and then a corridor led on to the conservatory. And in the breakfast room, there are a number of Tiffany Studios windows that framed the view of the water in addition to um, these wonderful allegorical murals. There were these wonderful plants hanging on trellises and in boxes. So you can see how the home was amazingly plant filled. And this all speaks to De Lamar's pride in his plant collection. And so this is the view that you would have seen from the breakfast room. And here's the conservatory um, in the distance that was added on in 1914 to the house. So there are two gorgeous windows by Tiffany Studios that frame that bay window, and these include beautiful balustrades and wisteria amongst peacocks and cockatoos, and these are so colorful. Just try to imagine in your mind's eye how this would have been illuminated by the sunlight and been a focal point for this room. And also up above, you can just barely see in the mirror's reflection here, there's another Tiffany skylight. And we'll look at that in just a moment, but I wanted to point out how popular the peacock feathers and peacock designs were at the time for Tiffany Studios and another of other makers. Um, this monumental vase by Tiffany's company in the late 1890s is at the MFA Houston and has this beautiful iridescent for real glass. And then this peacock lampshade um, also shows how this motif was incorporated into their luxury products. So getting back to the estate, um, here you can see another view of that corridor leading to the conservatory. And here's a floor plan where you can see this conservatory is almost as large as the mansion itself. So that was an 82 room mansion and the conservatory was humongous. So leading to the corridor, there was this beautiful skylight that led from the breakfast room to the conservatory and it shows this gorgeous opalescent glass depicting a beautiful sky with wisteria blossoms. And this truly must have dazzled guests. As you can see here in another view in detail, there are a number of birds incorporated to the design. And interestingly, in the conservatories itself, there were a number of birds flying around freely amongst the tropical house. 
which was actually likened to a tropical jungle in a number of newspaper articles at the time. So here you can see De Lamar standing on a bridge leading to a gazebo at the center of the tropical house, which had a circular pool that was beautifully tiled with designs. And this conservatory grew a number of plants like palm trees, as well as fruit trees to grow bananas, grapefruit and oranges, which would have been very costly at the time for most people. And so by having them grown on his property, he would have them at his disposal for entertaining. So this was quite a luxurious space. And the cost at the time was estimated to be $500,000, which was a staggering amount of money to spend. And De Lamar was willing to spend that money because he wanted to entertain at the highest level. And he had made a huge fortune in mining operations and as a financier. And he really wanted to show off to all of his guests. Unfortunately, though, De La Mar um, died in 1918, so he only enjoyed his country estate for a relatively short time, but it was featured in a number of articles like this one from 1916 that is titled Bringing Florida to Glen Cove, where you can see an array of flowers in the tropical house. And after De La Mar died, his daughter Alice inherited Pembroke, and she auctioned off his huge art collection that is now dispersed amongst many art museums and private collections. And this home proved to be too enormous for her taste. She had a number of homes in New York and Palm Beach that she spent her time at, but she sold this estate after a few years. And the later owners, did not have the ability to keep up the maintenance for these extensive gardens and this mansion. So they ended up building a smaller home down by the water um, to be closer to the bay. And they didn't live in Pembroke or keep the conservatory going. And so you can see the huge contrast from around 1915 and 1960, where the gardens have become bare because Pembroke was too costly to keep up. And this happened to a number of mansions on the Gold Coast over the years. Sadly, these a number of these buildings only stood for one generation because they were just too expensive to keep up. And this happened um, with a number of surrounding properties that had their own golf courses and landscape architects that designed beautiful grounds. And some of these mansions um, fell into disrepair. And for instance, Laurelton Hall had a fire in 1957 and a number of the beautiful details were salvaged from the space, which is likely what happened to Pembroke um, with the Tiffany window there before it was demolished in 1968. So you can see here this image of the conservatory um, where there was once a grotto with a fountain um, that was behind that gazebo in the central pool. And here um, is where the Tiffany window was located above the entrance. And while you can't really see here, I presume that the window had been taken out of the building by that time. And um, it was later auctioned in the 1970s and Walter Chrysler acquired it. So now I would like to just close with giving you um, some of the work I'm currently researching at Cotizon. So I'm sure many of you are familiar that Cotizon is the winter residence that John and Mabel Ringling built in the mid 1920s. It sits on Sarasota Bay and is a 36,000 square foot mansion um, that they came to during the winter season. And it's a beautiful Mediterranean revival style mansion that has many mysteries that I've been searching for answers on. And one of those is where the windows came from 
for the tap room, which was the Ringling's own private bar room. So there's an array of different kinds of art glass in this space, from the colored glass windows that look out to the garden. There's grapevine motif windows that are inset into the wood paneling and doors to wet bars. And there's also these beautiful enameled medallions that are set behind the bar in opalescent glass framing that is really high quality and could possibly have come from Europe, but we don't have documents that confirm the maker or the company. And so I'm hoping to one day rediscover who made these and where the Ringlings acquired them from. And here is one detail that I've been trying to find more out about. This signature C Brandt is on the medallion with the maiden holding a tray of food. And this person still is unidentified, but I'm hopeful that I can search in newspapers and publications at the time because Cartesan drew a lot of attention in the press. And I hope to figure out who may have been the glassmaker or the enamelist. And there also is a landscape seen across from the bar that has a hunter and a deer. And it's definitely um, not a Tiffany window, even though that's a generic term for windows made in the early 20th century. Um, but there were so many American and European companies at the time that were producing beautiful work, um, but now have fallen into obscurity. So I'm hoping to continue searching for who made these windows and perhaps um, this will be another talk down the road. But at that point, I'm finished with my talk today and I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, uh, Marissa, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, uh, a perfect balance of um, kind of references specific to our show and to the story we're telling and to your broader research and uh, to Tiffany and Tiffany Studios uh, in, in general. So that was a perfect encapsulation of, of many things. Uh, also an illustration of a point that I'm reminded of every time we have an external speaker who, who participates in our shows and that we should do all these things before we actually open the exhibition so that I have a better understanding of the subject <laughs> before we present it to the public, um, because your understanding is um, uh, very rich and, and the way that you put this together was, was really beautiful. Um, a question for you, um, one, I guess, specific to our show and then one um, to reference another aspect of your work at the Ringling. Um, the first one is it's sort of an easy one. It's, do you have a favorite work um, that is on view currently uh, at the Tiffany Show at Selby Gardens? That's a great question. Um, it's really hard to pick a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, there were some beautiful pieces. Um, there was a piece that really caught my eye that was an enameled box, I believe that had a wonderful design on it. And I don't have it in the slideshow, unfortunately, but it was something I had never seen before. And while there's been a lot of research and publication on Tiffany Studios over the years, to not have seen that work before just really stopped me in my tracks. But that's why special exhibitions are wonderful. Um, you get to see new things and it takes years and years of looking at this stuff to make these kinds of connections. So, that's why I love my job. You learn something new every day and it's great to see new things. Wonderful. Uh, we have a, a question from one of the participants um, about the popularity of the peacock theme or design. Um, and do you know where that sort of originates and, and why it, it uh, took off as such a, a popular motif in the work of this period? That could be a whole other lecture. <laughs> it's a very rich subject, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a growing interest for exotic design inspiration at the turn of the century with the Art Nouveau movement in France spreading internationally into America. And so not only flowers, but different kinds of birds were depicted again and again by different companies that had their own interpretation of 
presenting that bird. And I think with the beautiful colors and that iridescent quality to the feathers, it was really a perfect design inspiration for Tiffany, who was working with a number of talented chemists and glassmakers to imitate that look in a variety of different luxury goods. And so I think it starts with the Art Nouveau, but also there was an, the aesthetic movement happening at the time um, that was also looking to nature for inspiration. And that really took off in England in the late 19th century. So it's really a combination of all of these influences spreading and getting attention often at World's Fairs. Um, so Tiffany Studios won a number of awards at World Fairs, um, like the Dragonfly Design. Um, by Clara Driscoll. That was one of the few times she was noted as a designer at the firm. Um, but yeah, I digress. But anyways, the peacock feather was popular with a lot of different designers. Mm -hmm. There's um, one um, blown glass vase in the show, ironically, a gooseneck vase that features the, the, the peacock design. So if um, our, our visitors have a chance to come back before the show ends. They can see that on view. Um, I, can I add something about that yes, piece? Um, absolutely. So Tiffany was often inspired by different cultures and different eras in history. And so he was often mining history. And for the gooseneck design, that's something that came out of the Middle East for centuries earlier. And so Tiffany had a number of other designs that we couldn't cover today, um, but... The gooseneck is one of his most famous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a a, a beautiful form for sure. Um, most of the lamps that are on view were designed, I guess, from their inception as being electric lamps. But the the one that you showed, the base of the dragonfly lamp, is something different. Uh, it, it, whether it was designed as an oil lamp or it's referencing one. Um, it certainly has a, a very different form and looks like a different function. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how uh, an oil lamp um, would have uh, just, I guess, the, the different technology would have influenced the experience of the lamp itself? Sure. Um, well, keep in mind that electricity and incandescent light bulbs were new technology at the turn of the century. So some of Tiffany's lamps were the earliest available designs that sh used the lights um, that were much brighter than what most people were used to at the time. And so putting these beautiful, colorful lampshades around them, um, it really was a decorative object in the home as well as a useful object. And I believe Tiffany's, one of his earlier companies did make fuel lamps using oil, um, but the electrified lamps um, really took off because um, even though it was a more expensive technology at the time, it appealed to his clientele. It was extra special. And then a lot of other companies began to imitate it. So there's that term Tiffany lamp applied to almost everything from the era, even though they're not all Tiffany and the same quality, but he really was a tastemaker and a trendsetter. Um, I haven't seen a Tiffany lamp functioning with the oil fuel, so I can't say exactly how that would have looked, mm -hmm. um, but it definitely was dazzling and new to have light bulbs with those Tiffany lamps. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about seeing this work in person is um, it takes us back to a time, you know, obviously to think about um, the invention of, of the electric light bulb and, and the electric lamp as being a, a new and innovative thing. Obviously, for anyone uh, on this call, it's it's uh, it's an aspect of history that, that has become commonplace and is is just part of our everyday lives. Um, and I think it's fascinating both with the technology of the, um, you know the the way that it's illuminated, but also just the you talked about uh, uh, Tiff Tiffany working with chemists and and scientists that there's a there's a technological innovation to the to the material itself that we look back at and think, well, that's very much a, a reflection of, of a time long gone by. Um, but the, the innovative aspect of this work is really quite, quite extraordinary. Um, yeah, it's definitely multifaceted. You can look at this from a number of angles and 
if our viewers today haven't been to the Corning Museum of Glass in Corning, New York, it's a wonderful place to explore the history of glass from a scientific angle, going back to ancient times to the present. And there's some amazing Tiffany windows there too, where they have whole galleries of Tiffany works. I have um, one last question, and actually that's a, a, a reference to other institutions as a perfect setup. Um, you are responsible not only for uh, Katazan, the historic home at, at the Ringling, but also the Kotler Coville Glass Pavilion and the uh, strong collection in, in sort of modern and contemporary glass for which this area, particularly the, uh, the sort of Tampa Bay region is, is known. Um, and when one looks at um, the work of contemporary glass artists, it looks like it's a, a you know a million miles and a million years away from what we're seeing here. But there um, there must be some form of inheritance here, uh, having having talked about the the innovative aspects of the glass making and glass production that we've seen illustrated today. Um, as someone who has an interest in uh, in glass and it, in its history and production and is responsible for work that spans all those different eras. Uh, can you speak a little bit to uh, connections or parallels that you see between past and present in the, in the medium? Sure. Well, the glass pavilion, we just had a rotation. We do a couple rotations a year where I'm able to work with my colleagues to put new acquisitions on view and works that have not been displayed before. Um, so we get a number of gifts and work on museum purchases throughout the year. And we just did an installation the last two weeks where I put out a number of works by artists who mine the history of art and glass to say something new. So if you have a chance to visit the pavilion, it's open seven days a week and it's free. It's the one gallery at the museum that's free. So you can drop in again and again to take in the collection. And there's a beautiful new work on view on the second floor titled Celine by the British American artist, Joanna Manousis, that is inspired by the rose windows of Gothic churches throughout Europe, but she's completely re-envisioned it with opaline glass, this watery white glass. And so she's created this amazing wall-mounted sculpture that references so many different things from mythological characters. Selene was the goddess of the moon in ancient Greek world. And, um, but she was developing a whole new kind of glass that isn't produced anymore. So she did a lot of experimentation in the studio. And that's just one work that has all these different layers of meaning and beautiful craftsmanship. So everything that I curate in that gallery, I try to draw connections between works. Um, there might be pieces by a student and their mentor alongside each other and different um, cases explore different periods, um, different aesthetic interpretations. So it's really an exciting, innovative period today internationally. and there's always something new to see there. So every several months, we might change out several works um, to keep things fresh. And that's a whole other topic, <laughs> but there really are exciting artists. So if you have time to spend there to read the labels and learn the backstories about the artist, um, their techniques that are being used um, and the symbolic meaning behind the compositions, there's really a lot more to learn today as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. It is an amazing space and, and a beautiful collection, always beautifully presented. So I would strongly encourage our, our guests to go and check it out. Um, I think with that, we will uh, draw today's session to a close. Um, Marissa, thank you very, very much for sharing your, your expertise with us. This was a wonderful presentation and a great way to celebrate the work of Louis Comfort Tiffany and Tiffany Studios and a great way to um, sort of bring our Tiffany experience at uh, Selby to a, to a near close. Um, and with that, I would just encourage um, our guests today, if you have not seen the show or if you wanna see it again before it comes down, uh, this is the final week of, of its run at Selby Gardens. Um, and we are open until Sunday. So the, the show is up through the end of the week. Uh, at which point it will come down, the collection will go back to its home, uh, we will disassemble the outdoor elements and we will move on to our next project. But 
this has been a particularly popular one and a very special one for the team. I think everybody enjoyed working on it. And um, Marissa, really appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge and, and insights with us today to sort of put it all into context. So thank you very much for your participation and thank you to all those who have joined us today. Um, we appreciate your support of Selby Gardens. And until next time, we'll, uh, we'll see you uh, around the campus, hopefully sometime too. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.